And I just want to welcome everybody to our Tri-State SHRM meeting for September. Uh, my name is J.W. Bramlett. I am the current president of the local chapter, which is Tri-State SHRM Texarkana. I uh, just really appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day. And in case you missed it, I do apologize for having the wrong link originally tied to the emails that you received. Uh, so again, a formal thank you to Adele and, and uh, Brittany for emailing me and letting me know that the link was not correct. And so I could get that corrected so we could still have our meeting because I was kind of worried there for a minute. Um, I was like, you know, I, it was finally my turn to present at a meeting and, and I botched it and now we're not going to get to have it. So I'm glad we got on track to still have our meeting. So um, just a kind of a couple updates. We recently had our chapter bylaws vote to amend those bylaws. They were last amended in 2019. And so it's been a couple of years. Uh, one of the biggest changes was just reformatting it to reflect the format that Sherm National uh, prefers. So it kind of aligns with their strategy. And uh, that was the biggest change. We did add a few other things. Uh, one of the most notable ones is to really acknowledge the online voting more, uh, especially in this virtual environment where we used to, it was just kind of understood, we're always going to be in person to be able to conduct votes, and now that's not the case. And so we wanted to make sure our bylaws reflected that. So we are, you know, indeed following them to the T as much as possible. And uh, and then our other announcement that I'd like to make everybody aware is, is that um, we recently purchased a meeting owl. And if you have not heard of the Meeting Owl, I suggest you go check it out online. It is a really cool device that allows you to have uh, hybrid meetings to where you can have in-person meetings, but those that either don't feel comfortable to attend in person or just are unable to uh, can still attend virtually. And we had planned to roll that out for today's meeting. We had planned to originally be back at Texarkana College on their campus and have a hybrid meeting. But Texture County College called us about probably about two weeks ago now and informed us that because of the rising COVID numbers, that they were going to continue to not allow outside groups onto their campus. So that led to kind of a, a quick pivot to just stay virtual uh, for the time being. We'll revisit that for the October meeting and see where they stand at that point. But I would at least expect to be virtual throughout the rest of this calendar year. Because uh, I don't see things, you know, getting just drastically better over the next few months. But you know, we, we can certainly be hopeful, and uh, I, I know that I'm ready to get back to in person. Um, but I also understand that everybody's not comfortable with that, and so that's where that meeting owl will come in handy. And again, go check it out. I'd like to thank one of our sponsors of that meeting owl, which is Steve Collier. Uh, he is a board member on this for this chapter, Tri-State Sherm Texarkana. And he also has a consulting agency called Southwest HR Business Partners. He is a former uh, HR director at BWI here locally. And he now has this consulting practice based out of Horseshoe Bay, Texas. And Steve is not here today for this meeting, but he did provide a $250 donation or sponsorship rather towards the purchase of that meeting out. And so we just want to make sure that we recognize his sponsorship and you'll see something more formal coming out in, in your email and we'll continue to promote his consulting agency for his sponsorship over the next several months and uh, if anybody else would be interested if you are a business owner or you're on the marketing side of your business and you would like to also sponsor the meeting i will be glad to discuss that with you and and promote your business as well in support of Tri-State Sherm Texture Canada and what we're trying to do for the local HR community. Uh, last note is that uh, the October meeting will be our annual meeting, okay? So what that means for you is that it's coming up to the time of the year again where it's time to pick our board members and our committee chairs for 2022. Uh, our terms or our, our year for our chapter is as a calendar year, January through December. And so our board members serve from January through December, unless you're an at-large member, and those are rotating three-year terms. And so coming up in October, uh, at that meeting, you'll have the opportunity to 
to nominate yourself or someone else, if you so choose, to be on the board for 2022. And we do have some vacancies coming up. Uh, I will be, my term will be expiring. I've served two years as president of the chapter. And so Latanya McElroy will be taking over as president. Uh, Juliana Gonzalez will be taking over as president elect. And then we have a couple people stepping down from their role. And so we will need to fill those. And all that information will be in the emails that you'll receive. So that way you can kind of do some research and see if that's something that you're interested in. And I would highly encourage it. You know, we don't want the board to become stagnant and stale. Uh, we want people to have the opportunity to rotate off because we're all very busy, uh, you know, and we can all make excuses for why we don't have time to serve on the board, but, um, but it's a good opportunity to kind of step up into a leadership role, uh, really increase your network and build some great relationships with some of our local HR partners here in Texarkana. So be looking for that for the October meeting, which is our annual meeting. And now I will go ahead and move forward to our presentation. We were originally gonna have Jack Roberts with Infinity Workforce Solutions to talk about uh, online training and communications. Unfortunately, he had a change of plans and he is not able to present today. So in his place, you get yours truly, all right? I'm gonna be giving you all a presentation over uh, discipline approaches. So let me pull up my presentation now. And just kind of give me a nod if everybody's able to see that PowerPoint. Okay, good deal. All right, so my presentation is gonna be over discipline approaches and performance improvement plans. Um, when my wife asked me last night what I was gonna be talking about, she said, wow, y'all are really, really exciting that this is what you're going to be talking to, to your, your peers about is discipline. And I was like, I know it's exciting stuff, but I honestly do kind of enjoy discipline and performance improvement plans. This is a presentation that I saw here recently at um, TMHRA. So that's the Texas Municipal Human Resources Organization. So it's all these HR professionals, just like mostly that are involved in SHRM and and uh, their state organizations, but it's just municipalities, government entities. And there was an attorney there that is a labor law attorney. And, uh, and he gave this presentation and I really, really liked it. And so my goal was to bring it back to Texarkana and see if I can't try to implement it more so or in a better way here within my organization. So this is my first time giving this presentation. So y'all are gonna kind of be my, uh, my beta testing to see how it goes. Uh, but this is something I'm passionate about to some extent. I like performance management. I like um, this, this aspect of kind of changing your culture and cultivating your organization because it is easy for this to be such a negative thing. Uh, but it can also be something that can really turn your organization around. And, and kind of the background on me, why I probably do like this this aspect of my job is that I'm a former coach. Uh, I was in education for eight years at Pleasant Grove ISD. Uh, I taught physical education. I coached football, baseball, basketball, soccer, volleyball. Uh, I think that's about it, softball. Um, so, so I understand, I think I take it from a different mindset where if you never, if your job was never to actually coach, physically coach, you know, that's what we're kind of told a lot now in the HR field is you should be coaching and growing your workforce and your employees. And, um, and if, unless that was ever truly your profession, it may not feel comfortable to you to really coach. And for me, that's exactly where I came from. And so with coaching comes discipline and it comes with, it comes a fancy name for coaching, which uh, performance improvement plans can be hand in hand with coaching. So, that's where I come from on this. And I think that's why I kind of do enjoy uh, the aspect of it. Now, the disclaimer is no one, I know none of you truly enjoy discipline. You know, the person that is giving it doesn't enjoy it. The person on the receiving end doesn't enjoy it. Uh, nobody is happy about being in that situation. And we would all honestly rather be doing something else than in that moment having to have that uncomfortable conversation with somebody 
but it is necessary and it should be used properly. Uh, and I even go back to your parents, your parents, you know, while sometimes you may have really deserved it, they probably didn't really enjoy, you know, getting that wooden spoon out and, uh, and using it to correct whatever behavior that they, that they caught you doing, but, but it is necessary. And I think we all, uh, we all, we all love accountability, right? We all talk about how people should be held accountable. We don't always like it when we're held accountable sometimes, but I think if it's done in the right way, you see the value in it and people do want to be coached. Uh, they may not always acknowledge it to you, but they want to be coached. They want to be corrected. They want to have some structure and it's that fine line, you know, between going overboard, obviously, but that's where it just takes a lot of practice. And so the first thing I want to do is kind of define what discipline is, right? And just taken directly from the dictionary, it's the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior using punishments to correct disobedience. That is the exact definition from the dictionary. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. It doesn't sound like anything fun by any means, right? It doesn't sound like anything that anybody's going to enjoy. So you're probably thinking in the back of your mind, you know, why, why are you acting like you enjoy this presentation or this topic when it sounds so negative? And that's because kind of what's coming next on the flip side of discipline. So let's talk about the, dis the difference between discipline and what I really consider coaching. But you know, within the HR world, we, we always call them performance improvement plans. But I think you can use those for coaching. Let's talk about your children. I know a lot of you are probably parents. Uh, if you're not, you probably had nieces and nephews that you probably experienced this with. But first, let's talk about your child and discipline and their homework. Now, your child doesn't complete his or her homework. You know, you told them multiple times, get your homework done, done by this time of the day or done by this day of the week. And they don't do it. They just flat out refuse to do it. They put it off and put it off and they didn't get it accomplished. So what do you do with that as a parent? You, you ground the child. You know, that's the discipline. That's the punishment for trying to correct that behavior in that child. They just flat out refuse to do it. Okay. However, when a child doesn't understand their homework, what do you typically do? You try to get them help, right? You try to either hire a tutor, you send them to whatever study methods are being conducted at that school. You try to get them some sort of support to help make them successful, All right? So there's the difference right there is that you have a behavioral issue where the child just flat out refused to do what they were told to do. So you, you provide discipline. On the other hand, you have a performance issue where the child does not understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. So you provide them help and guidance, all right? Same thing with your employee. So let's flip it to what we deal with every day. Employee fails to show up on time. You probably have some sort of policy about failing to show up on time. So aside from what all nuances there may be about you know, reporting a certain, but by a certain time of the day and what's allowed, not allowed there, ultimately there's discipline involved for that. They did not follow the policy. They did not show up for work on time. You provide discipline to try to correct that behavior, right? However, if you have an employee that is working hard, they show up on time, they, but they are failing to complete tasks properly, then that's a opportunity for coaching. That's a performance issue, right? They haven't violated a policy. They're not being rude, disrespectful. Uh, it's not a behavioral trait. It's just a performance trait that they, they are struggling with that task. So there's the opportunity for coaching and the performance improvement plan. So I know from my experience, we have you know roughly seven or eight different departments here at the city. And honestly, at times, it feels like we're managing seven or eight different businesses you've got public works, you've got parks and recreation, you've got finance, you've got uh, the police department, fire department, human resources, inspections and code enforcement, municipal court. It's like running a lot of different businesses because in and of themselves, a lot of them have 20, 30, 40 or more employees. And they're managed by people with a lot of different personalities. And so I run into this exact type of example at times where 
where I find supervisors trying to uh, discipline for performance issues. And I feel like they're missing the boat on that. I feel like they are disciplining incorrectly. And so my goal after I came back from this conference is to try to get our supervisors to more consistently apply this approach to performance issue. Let's try to coach and provide some sort of uh, performance improvement plan. Now, there's a stigma tied to performance improvement plans, and we're going to kind of get to that. So how should a PIP, you know, that's what we often refer to performance improvement plans, how should a PIP be used? You don't use it to correct behaviors, attitudes, laziness, or just a lack of trying. Again, that's where you go with the discipline. Performance is actually in that name, right, a performance improvement plan. So that's what we want to use when we're dealing with performance. That's what I really want to focus on here on this slide. And you do have to change the mindset because probably you know this, I know this. There are probably some managers out there that have used performance improvement plans perfectly, right? Exactly the way I'm kind of talking about it. But on the flip side, you probably got a lot of them out there, a lot of supervisors that have tr truly used them just to try to terminate somebody. That was their only goal, their only end game in ever initiating a performance improvement plan was to lay the groundwork to try to get rid of this person. And so you do have to change the mindset in your organization if you want to use it in this way. And I feel like it's a better way to use it because I feel like you should always be trying to do everything you can to keep your employees. We all know now in this environment how hard it is to obtain and hire qualified individuals that are going to be here for the long term. And so it's a whole lot easier to keep people and do your best to build them and coach them than to just um, get rid of them the first time they make a mistake and then spend months trying to recruit, spending a lot of time and effort to replace somebody that may have the same flaws of, of the person that you just got rid of. You, you don't ever know uh, what you're getting. And so it does take a cultural change. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy, uh, depending on your organization. But you got to reinforce that this is not punishment. You know, I am not using this as your supervisor. I am not using this as punishment. I am using this to assist you and coach you to improve upon an area that I see needs improvement. And I want to separate behavior from performance. And by doing so, I'm going to say separate discipline from your PIPs. And it's going to be basically how, you know, what, how you live this out? You know, is it just going to be words that you're saying that you're saying you're going to do it this way, and then you act another way, or are you actually going to uh, execute and um, and your behavior, your own behavior, is going to reflect what you are saying? And I think if that happens, you know, over time, your employees are going to see that you are you're practicing what you preach. You know, you're preaching that you're using PIPs to coach us and improve our performance and not just get rid of us, now, okay, I'm buying in. You know, as an employee, now I'm gonna buy into that and I'm not gonna be as scared if you approach me and say, hey, I'm gonna put you on a PIP to try to work on this performance. Uh, now, termination, obviously, because anytime you mention these things, you know, the, the negative employees are always gonna go, yeah, but you know, you could still fire me if I don't you know, meet all their qualifications. Well, sure, I mean, if you fail to perform the essential functions of your job, all of us are eligible to be replaced. I mean, we're all here to do a job. This is not a, a life sentence when you get hired onto, onto your employer. It's not a guaranteed uh, a thing unless you, you have a contract that just never ends. But we all have the expectation from whoever we report to that I have to perform the essential functions of my job to the expectations of my supervisor. And so, so true. Uh, any kind of documentation could always result in the termination. But again, termination does not have to mean that this employee is a bad person. He or she simply just may have lacked the skill set for the job. And instead of allowing somebody to stay in a position year after year after year and create other disgruntled employees because work is not getting done correctly, this PIP can point out those issues and help get the right people in the right jobs. And 
And also termination doesn't always have to mean that person leaves the company altogether. You know, there may be a better fit for them still within the organization, but doing something that's more in line with their skill set. So now let's look at some common discipline mistakes. So now we're transitioning back into discipline. Okay, so not necessarily with behavior or not necessarily with performance where we're using the PIPs, but discipline. Okay, let's talk about verbal warnings. We use verbal warnings here at the city and uh, this presenter made a very good point about verbal warnings. And I, I think we'll continue to use them, but I do think we, we need to uh, revisit how we view verbal warnings. Because in a world where HR says to document everything, these can become somewhat meaningless and useless moving forward if issues continue to present themselves. You know, based on their name alone, they really, they can't be tracked, right? You cannot track that you had a verbal conversation with somebody. There's always that chance of somebody saying they didn't have the conversation, right? That you did not engage with them and make them aware or they don't remember. So in and of themselves, they can't be tracked. And so it's tough to use them later on if you can't show an attorney that it absolutely without a doubt took place. And if you can track them, then they're no longer really verbal warnings. They're, they're kind of written warnings. If you wrote it down, it kind of becomes in reality a written warning and you'll never convince employees that this is a verbal warning, but I'm going to document everything and you sign it, but it's a verbal warning. In their mind, it's a written warning. You know what I mean? And so you can't convince those employees otherwise. So uh, this particular presenter, he suggested get rid of verbal warnings. Um, I still like them. I, I think they can still be valuable, especially when it comes to coaching and, and counseling an employee. But, but I get where he's coming from this. So this is more of a slide I left in here because it may apply to your organization and some it may not. Um, to continue on this, this mindset, you know, verbal warnings don't really provide a lot in the way of a, like a fear factor. You know, so if you're truly trying to correct behavior and there's nothing that documents that this warning took place, then does it really change behavior? Probably not. It probably lays the groundwork for your next step, which may be a written warning. But then if that's the case, if that's the only thing you have to show that this took place, then why wouldn't you just start with the written warning? So I kind of get that mindset too. Um, and this doesn't mean you should abandon ongoing verbal counseling. This is the part I put in here because again, we use verbal warnings here. I think they do have some significance, but I also understand the side he's coming from. So I think that's just something uh, you have to decide what's best for your organization. And, you know, if you kind of agree with him and think, yeah, verbal warnings are kind of pointless, let's get rid of them and just start straight off with a written warning. Or if you still see value in them, then you should definitely keep them. Kitchen sink terminations. Uh, I have crossed this path with supervisors where when it comes time to, to where they want to get rid of somebody, they want to outline everything the employee has ever done, everything bad they can think of on that person, all right? What I would ask you to do, whether you're a supervisor or you're the HR person responsible for communicating this with your supervisors is, let's find the one or maybe even two, the ultimate reasons why this individual should be terminated. We're not going to go back six months to a year and start, we're going to, we're going to now document everything and say, we're getting rid of you because of all these things. Well, if you've done your discipline and your documentation correctly, that should have already been addressed. And I don't need to necessarily rehash it all and say, I'm firing you because of this. No, the reason why I'm letting you go now is because there are these one or two reasons that, are, that have just occurred. And this is where we're gonna draw the line. You know, I may, ref I may reference other things, previous disciplinary actions. But what I see is that there are no previous disciplinary actions. It's, it's kind of handwritten notes that the supervisor has kept over a year, but they've never been really properly dealt with. And now they want to bring it up and add to that what just happened. And that's, that's not the best way to do it because you should have addressed those problems 
six months ago, and maybe we could have corrected this and never even got to the point where we needed to terminate the person. Um, this kind of goes to the next topic, the next bullet point here, a company's effort at documenting previously undocumented disciplinary issues. You know, a supervisor comes to you and uh, I've gotten all these, I've gotten all these little tidbits of notes written down and I've, I've documented everything. Okay, well, did you ever communicate the issues with the employee and address them? Well, no, I didn't do that. I documented it all. Well, if you never addressed it with the employee, then they may be completely unaware that whatever the performance or disciplinary issue is going on, that it's a problem, right? And so supervisors trying to do that, go back and kind of formally, formally write up things that they just made chicken scratch on, that's a no-no, all right? Inevitably, when you try to lump everything together and say, I'm getting rid of you for a whole year's worth of things all at once here, you're inevitably gonna go overboard with it and you're gonna make mistakes and attorneys are gonna find those mistakes. And it could maybe even cost you your job for not doing a very good job of, of uh, being a supervisor or managing you know, your disciplinary action process, or it could just really embarrass your organization if it were to continue on um, in the court system. And kitchen sink terminations are gonna overshadow the true reason for the termination. You know, if somebody was late three times and then six months later, they didn't do something very well. And then three months later, now they make a mistake and you're going to say, I want to get rid of you for all these things. Well, you're not getting rid of them because they were late six months ago. You're getting rid of them because maybe there was a pattern of behavior. But did you again, did you ever address the problem early on to try to correct it? to prevent them from reaching this point? Most likely the answer is no, they probably didn't document all that and address it as it was happening. And as HR professionals, um, hopefully, you know, you, you have enough of a voice to kind of have some input on this, but when we don't require our supervisors to do this correctly, all we are doing as an organization is rewarding poor discipline management. You know, at the end of the day, we hopefully, again, hopefully you have this ability within your organization, but we have to hold our supervisors accountable and not allow them to get away with doing it this way and then cleaning up the mess at the very end, you know, because I think maybe the mindset sometimes is that's what HR is for is to kind of clean it up here at the end and make it to where it's all on the up and up. But that's not fair to us. It's not fair to the employee. And it's not holding that supervisor accountable for the reason why they get paid more than the other employees. They get paid more because they have extra responsibilities. And this is part of their responsibility. And I think we have to hold them accountable to that. Some other issues are incomplete disciplinary notices, right? A lack of a complete description of the incident, the behavior that led to the discipline. You know, just writing down a sentence of something that's that doesn't give you any kind of clear picture as to what happened is a problem to me. Uh, a lack of referencing previous discipline, right? If you if you have disciplined this person before, uh, especially if it's for the same thing, then reference that in the current discipline. Show that it is a pattern. You know, you're not. Uh, we're not talking about termination really at this point but you have dealt with this before and that, it just kind of paints a really clear picture. So that way when attorneys do get this and they have a disciplinary write-up and you have referenced previous disciplinary write-ups, well, then that lets that attorney know, okay, I can go back and reference these other disciplinary write-ups to really create a clear picture of what has happened. All right. So that's very key is to include that. Uh, lack of a description of further potential discipline I think this is very important. I find that our supervisors leave this off regularly and I have to go back and, and make sure they add it is laying out the consequences. If you do not improve this behavior, this is what may happen. You don't have to say it will happen because that kind of that kind of handcuffs you into doing it, absolutely doing it if it happens again. But it may lead to you know, uh, two days off without pay. It may lead to a uh, suspension for this amount of time. It may lead to a termination. 
you know, make them aware. That way they cannot come, the employee cannot come back and say, well, no one ever told me what was going to happen if I didn't improve my behavior or if I didn't improve this or that. No, we can go back and look and we outlined exactly the consequence, what the consequences were going to be if you did not show improvement on that. And then a lack of description for remedial steps or action to be taken uh, ties into this potential discipline. So sometimes there may be things that need to occur as a part of this discipline, right? They may need to attend some sort of training. They may need to, uh, you know, take on some, some duties or show some improvement in some area. And, and you want to outline that too. Again, what are your expectations moving forward from this? What's the potential discipline that will occur if those steps or that action is not taken? And then getting everybody to sign off on it. You know, I know this is always something that comes up. People don't want to sign off because they feel like they're admitting to some sort of guilt. And, uh, and I would just highly encourage you to get signatures if at all possible. And if they refuse to sign, you know, have a witness in the room, which I'm going to talk about coming up and have somebody sign showing that that person refused to sign. Next thing here is surprise disciplinary notices, right? We're talking about a discipline that was never discussed with or provided to the employee. So maybe I've been lucky enough where this hasn't happened to me personally um, since I've been working in HR, but I know, I, I don't doubt that it has happened. And some of you may have some stories of it, but you know, disciplining somebody for something that they were completely unaware of or putting discipline, disciplinary actions in somebody's file when it was never discussed with that employee, I could see how those things could happen. And so, you know, not that you need to be told this, but encouraging your supervisors that if there's a disciplinary action, that it is addressed with that employee. Multiple disciplinary notices provided to the employee at one time. I have had a supervisor try to do this before where the person did something like a month ago and then they did something yesterday. Well, they never addressed the action a month ago. So we're just going to discipline them for both things today. No, you, you messed up. You should have disciplined them a month ago when the other incident happened. And so um, you, need to, you need to navigate that and try to find a way to do this the right way. I'm not saying that you completely have to wipe the other incident clean, but we're not going to bring this person in here and throw on two disciplines on them here at one time. When, when you made a mistake as a supervisor and how you're going to handle that. And then terminating someone for something other than a major infraction when no previous discipline has been issued. I've had this happen. We had somebody that uh, had called into work two days in a row. Right? They call in and say that they've got car problems. Okay, supervisor understands the person lives 30 miles outside of Texarkana. You got car issues, you can't make it, I'm good. You called in, you did what you're supposed to do. On day three, the person did not call in and did not show up, all right? I get a call from the, the supervisor and the supervisor says, I want to fire him. I'm like, well, hold on. I mean, it's like 9.30 in the morning. You know, we're not that far into the day. I mean, they should have called in by now, true. But how do we know, for one thing, this person is not in the hospital, you know, they could have been in a car accident on their way to work. They could have been transported to the hospital and nobody has called us yet. Has anybody tried to reach out to that employee yet? Well, no, they should call us. I understand that. But if, again, if they are being transported to the hospital, their main concern is probably not to call their supervisor and say, hey, you know, I'm unconscious right now, but I want to call in so y'all don't fire me. Okay. But even after we called and found out where they were and they did just not call, okay? There is always that possibility. They still wanted to fire the person, okay? And they tried to use the previous two days against them. Remember I said they called in the previous two days and notified their supervisor. They tried to use that against them for not calling in the day. And I'm like, well, that's our policy. I mean, they, they followed the policy those two days. So I don't understand why we're gonna use something against them where they did what they were supposed to do Today, they didn't. Okay, that's fair. They, they violated the policy today, but we're really going to terminate somebody because they didn't show up for work one day, and you're telling me that they're a great employee and all these great things. Is this not something we can just 
you know, give them some sort of uh, written reprimand or a day off without pay. You know, we, we really want to terminate them and start over from scratch and spend two months recruiting somebody when you're telling me this is a good employee when they show up to work. So there are those instances. I mean, luckily I have lived through some of these to where I have these good real life examples and I'm sure some of you do too, but that's a good example of trying to terminate somebody for something that really was not a major infraction uh, with all things considered. And there was no previous discipline. This person had never been written up. Lack of honesty. Okay, I see this sometimes with my supervisors that are not uh, as confident maybe in, in dealing with discipline. And I'm not talking about malicious dishonesty, but they conceal the reasons for discipline to preserve an employee's feelings. You know, they really like the person, they're a nice person, and they just don't want to hurt their feelings, right? So they start coming up with things like the example at the bottom, you're not the right fit. I mean, that's not fair to that person. You know, tell address what the issue is. You know, if it's poor, poor performance, put them on a performance improvement plan. See if they can improve that performance. If not, then we, we part ways or we look for another role within the organization where you are able to perform the essential functions. And if not, then again, we part ways, but don't just tell them you're not the right fit to try to preserve your feelings because it doesn't help you in the long run as an employer. It doesn't help that individual as an employee moving forward. And, uh, and it's just not a good practice. But I only usually find that in my supervisors, again, that are typically not real confident in issuing discipline. So that just kind of goes back to training and making sure those supervisors are more confident dealing with those situations. Uh, disciplinary notices upon disciplinary notices. So if a current employee has more than three disciplinary notices in their personnel file, there's a problem, right? Uh, we're, again, we're talking about discipline here, not performance improvement plans, not performance issues, but issues where we're talking about behavior, attitude, laziness, uh, a lack of any kind of effort, right? We're not talking about people that are struggling to do something and they're giving their best effort, but behavioral problems. So if you've got those employees that have 10, 15, 20 for, uh, disciplinary write-ups, then you've got an issue, right? And you've got to address that issue. You're doing something wrong. Something's getting messed up in the process because that person shouldn't work there anymore. And they're probably creating a bad culture around them because other employees are going to see that that kind of behavior is tolerated. And how can you discipline another employee for similar behavior when you don't discipline this employee and follow up with some sort of consequence for it? Um, yeah, and this is a general rule, obviously. You should be willing to take into account special circumstances. And if somebody's been there 30 years, they may have four or five, all right? But, but you kind of know this when you see it. And I've come across this here uh, with somebody that has worked here a long time, and they, they had 10 or 15 disciplinary actions. And my first question to the supervisor was, why are they still here, you know? Um, and again, there was a long long story behind it and the current supervisors had changed throughout the years and we finally got a supervisor in there that was not going to tolerate that kind of behavior anymore and that person now is kind of on their last chance but for so long it had been tolerated and uh, it should be no surprise that it created a toxic environment in that particular department and we had trouble filling positions in there for years and years and years and and that was one of the issues uh, again, the next bullet point here is termination for something other than a major infraction when there are no previous disciplinary write-ups. You know, obviously major infractions without previous write-ups, sure, they could absolutely lead to termination. But, you know, my example that I gave you previously, called in twice, didn't call in the third day, is that really worth the termination? I know it's different for every organization, but for us, that's not something we normally terminate somebody for on the spot, you know, that's not a major infraction. We can, we can work with that person and try to get the, that behavior corrected. And then if it continues part ways, but, uh, but yeah, that's an issue there. Termination with no previous write-ups. Uh, keep in mind that we are talking about disciplinary notices, performance issues. This guy uh, kind of 
he enlightened me a little bit on this. And I, and I kind of agree now that he was okay with somebody that has maybe 10 performance improvement plans. You know, let's say they've been there 10 or 15 years. As long as those performance improvement plans led to improved performance and now they can do the job, you know, maybe those 10 things were 10 things that as their job evolved and they took on new tasks and they were taking on tasks that they weren't really comfortable with and struggled with, but they eventually succeeded with, then, then the problem was solved, right? They struggled with performance, you addressed it, they corrected performance, now they're an employee that is able to perform that essential function of that job. And so, again, that's different based on the situation, how long they work there, if they are taking on new tasks. Obviously, if they only have 10 tasks and they got 10 performance improvement plans, then maybe there's an issue there. But if they're constantly taking on new things and learning new things um, and they need that, that PIP to make sure they are held accountable for addressing their shortcomings, then I can understand where uh, multiple performance improvement plans should not necessarily raise a red flag if they are achieving what is outlined in the performance improvement plans. Emotional disciplinary notices, right? We've, we've heard supervisors come to us with emotionally charged words, using opinions rather than facts. They don't point out policies or rules or procedures that were violated. They're just going off their gut feeling and uh, and the example here is Carl has a bad attitude, so I want to get rid of Carl. OK, well, what happened? Right. I need the story. I need to know what was violated in this disciplinary notice, because that doesn't tell me a whole lot. That doesn't help me when I have to go and uh, try to debate this or appeal this with the unemployment agency. Uh, that doesn't help me if he sues us for terminating him for discrimination. This does not help me in, in preparing for that. So instead, which requires more work, but I like this statement down here, you know, Carl refused to perform a request from his supervisor and indicated several ways that he believed he could perform the task better. After the supervisor explained why she wished to have the task performed the way she did, Carl rolled his eyes and said whatever to his supervisor and walked away from her while she was still speaking. Such behavior violates section 3.8.2B of our employee handbook. That's a pretty good description there to where when they, if they end up quitting and they file for unemployment, you can say, no, we had an issue here and this is exactly what happened. Or if they sue you for uh, being terminated for a discriminatory reason, no, here's the reason why they were terminated instead of just giving you Carl has a bad attitude, right? It does require more work, but it sure does make things easier in the long run. The progressive problem, okay? Now we use the progressive disciplinary process here at the city. Uh, this particular speaker doesn't like it, but he did make the, the statement that obviously every organization is different. And I agree that for some this works, for us it does, for some it may not. But I can see his points in this, which is a progressive disciplinary policy can sometimes result in inflexibility and an employer's unwillingness to take appropriate action. And it may be because for whatever reason, you're so rigid in following it that you don't ever allow yourself to go from step one to four because you think you got to go one, two, three, four, you know, and it prevents you from addressing a problem because you're like, oh, we got to go verbal, we got to go first written, second written, third written, and then, you know, so on and so forth. And so you want to make sure that you have a policy written that allows you that flexibility. And that's example down here at the bottom. And this is from our policy uh, here at the city. And that is the organization is not obligated to use all the progressive disciplinary steps available. And we may begin the disciplinary process at any level up to and including immediate discharge, depending on the severity of the conduct, the employee's work performance and prior disciplinary history, the employee's length of service and any mitigating circumstances. So we allow ourselves some flexibility there to where we can go straight to termination if it's severe enough, or we can skip a verbal, go to written, or, or if, we give it, if we've given one written already, we don't have to give a second and a third written before you're terminated. We can just go first written, straight determination. I mean, there's a lot of uh, options there for us, but we haven't 
kind of backed ourselves into a corner where we have to follow this process and in that process make a lot of supervisors mad make a lot of other employees mad because we are just allowing this this problem employee to stick around and you're not addressing the problem uh consequences of our mistakes right discipline does not create a negative culture in and of itself if you remember at the very beginning i stated that people do like structure people like rules they like knowing what the expectations are even if they won't admit it to you we need that you know that's that's kind of how we thrive in a society is by we have structure all around us sometimes we don't even realize but it's there but what does create a negative culture is the gotcha discipline the discipline used to truly target somebody and get rid of them just for that purpose you're not trying to improve them you're not trying to help them become a better employee you're just looking for ways to discipline them, right? You spend so much of your time doing that, that if you would have spent that same amount of time trying to make them a better employee, you might have saved that employee, but instead you turned your back on them and you're just looking always for ways to get rid of them. The use of discipline for performance issues, all right? Remember that PIP is what really should be used for performance issues, not discipline. Using discipline for performance issues does create a negative culture because then you're seeing as kind of a cold hearted organization, right? You struggle performing a task, we get rid of you. We don't spend any time trying to help you achieve that task and become a good employee. And a lack of discipline can result in an unruly and ultimately negative culture. So that's kind of ties back to some of the things I mentioned previously about employees see what happens around them. And, and they realize that if people aren't being disciplined and problems aren't addressed, then now I'm a disgruntled employee because why am I trying so hard when this person gets written up all the time and y'all don't do anything with them? Uh, too often we don't properly address and correct problem behaviors through discipline. Performance, in all honesty, and you probably have seen this in your time in HR, performance rarely improves by discipline. It usually just beats the person down to where they give up and y'all end up parting ways, but you may have lost a potentially good employee if you would have invested some time and effort into improving that performance. Retaining problematic and disruptive employees obviously results in productivity problems, which is the title of this slide. And that's usually because you have a lack of discipline or you have vague, very unclear discipline. There's no, there's no outline of what's expected. Uh, and then also disgruntled employees that have a mission just to make life miserable, right? And like I mentioned before, before employees are learning by watching how other employees are treated. And I've touched on this about unemployment problems. If you're unable to establish the necessary requirements for misconduct as defined by the Texas Workforce Commission, the result of that is gonna be um, a lack of complete discipline records. You're not gonna be able to define those misconducts by the TWC. Uh, Texas Workforce Commission, they wanna see violations of policy, they want to see the inability to perform the essential functions of the job and the steps you took to address those issues. And if you can't show those, a lot of times you lose those cases, right? You go there, you try to appeal it. You've got bad documentation. You don't really know what all happened because the supervisor didn't document properly. They didn't uh, have any kind of uh, progressive discipline where they show that they tried to work with the person. They don't show a policy that was violated. They just say this person again uh, was rude or something very vague and, and you end up losing those, which can result in an increase your, in your unemployment tax rate. Increased lawsuit risk. I know, I don't know if any of us are attorneys on here, but you know, we all play one every day um, in our jobs, it seems like. And when we discipline incorrectly, we essentially encourage employees to contact lawyers, file administrative complaints, file lawsuits. We increase the likelihood of internal complaints and thus the risk of making errors elsewhere. Uh, we lose the ability to allege a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. We lose on the issue of pretext and we don't have good evidence to properly litigate. You know, when our attorney shows up finally and starts asking for documentation, we hand them some handwritten things down that are vague and not real clear. and They're not on our, our kind of our formal documentation. You know what's an attorney supposed to do with that and then when sometimes we get mad at the attorney right we say you know they're just not doing a very good job they, they couldn't fight our case and win but it really all started with the supervisor 
doing things correctly from day one. And so we put ourselves at risk of that. How to discipline correctly. Some of this is very basic, but it's good to kind of just mention immediately, right? Immediately upon observing the conduct and completing a disciplinary notice. The conduct is any behavioral issue or policy rule violation. That is what you need to do when, when you see that right away is not, not wait a day or two or a week, but do it as soon as possible. I know we're all busy and it, it gets to be difficult sometimes, but it's try to do that immediately is the most important. Conduct an investigation if necessary, and then administer that discipline immediately upon the conclusion of that investigation. Don't let incidents or behavior slide. You know, don't be scared to issue that first written warning. It is uncomfortable. And like I mentioned at the beginning, nobody likes discipline, but it is necessary. Otherwise, you will regret it later on when you wish you would have done something about uh, the problem. And now it's snowballed into something that you, you just can't even hardly manage. You know, you set yourself up for failure. Who should discipline? I'm going to try to get to these last slide or two quickly. I know we're at the end of our time, so I apologize for that, but we will be done here shortly. Uh, ideally, the employee's direct supervisor, right? A lot of times I feel like they try to put that off on HR, but HR is not the supervisor. We are not with that person day in and day out. We did not see the bad behavior. We did not witness the poor performance to issue a PIP. HR can be there to consult and advise and guide. We can be there as a witness, uh, but we're not the person that should be really issuing the discipline. That really should reside with that supervisor and make them own that, right? Make them own actually issuing that discipline if they really feel like it's worth issuing. Uh, this does require supervisor training, obviously. Uh, this can avoid claims of intimidation or retaliation if, if you're doing it the same way every time that supervisor is doing it instead of uh, somebody else. And then be willing, but be willing to deviate from this procedure depending upon the severity of the discipline and the availability of parties. You know, don't, don't avoid discipline because you can't find somebody else to sit in the room with you. You know, if it's got to happen uh, today, you know, don't put it off a week because, well, this person's on vacation, so I'm going to put off this discipline for a week. Figure out a way to achieve your own uh, expectations and performance management for yourself, right? You have performance uh, that you're supposed to be man, uh, meeting as well. What should be said? The facts, right? This may require a longer description, kind of about the example I gave you earlier, referencing policies. Don't be vague, be honest. Identify the specifics of the incident behavior. Remind the employee of any previous disciplinary notices. You know, this is not your first time that we've addressed this problem. Outline what the employee should or should not do moving forward. The consequences for those further failures. Indicate your desire to accomplish more than punishment. You know, reinforce, reinforce the fact that you want to see an improved employee. You're here to help them get better if they choose to do so. And then answer any questions and allow the employee to speak, respond, but apply appropriate limits. You know, don't allow them to go off on you necessarily, but allow them to voice their side, right? Because there may be another side of the story. Deliver in person. You know, don't do it over the phone or through email. Have a witness. HR is obviously a good witness for those meetings. Don't just hand over documentation, actually discuss it with that employee, provide a copy for them to read, all right? Deliver it humanely, uh, focus on improvement rather than defeating that person, but don't sugarcoat the problem, right? Lay it out there, keep it factual, all right? Don't try to make them feel better about it. It is what it is. They violated a policy, we're here to address it, here's the facts, and this is what I expect moving forward and then allow appropriate time to go over the discipline. If you're gonna need 30 minutes, don't allow a 10 minute meeting and then cut yourself short and, and kind of cut, take shortcuts in how you're trying to address that problem. So final thoughts, uh, three strikes and you're out, right? But not always. I know attorneys say that always, you know, everything depends. Uh, but typically if somebody has got three disciplinary actions, you should be asking yourself why they're still here. Require the employee to sign. I think it does help in the long run if it does lead to legal actions to show that that employee did sign off saying that they were aware of what was contained in that disciplinary action, uh, allow the employee to respond as fully as he or she wishes, uh, even if that means them writing something down themselves, give the employee copies of the discipline. Of course, that may uh, determine based on your state or local laws. Uh, if the, if the discipline is a second discipline, review the first one as well 
to ensure that everything was addressed from the first one. Sometimes things get overlooked and the first disciplinary action was never fully addressed. And now we're at a second discipline. So we may need to include some things in this one to, to kind of complete things that they should have completed from the first disciplinary action and then investigate prior to issuing discipline. If an investigation is warranted, don't just take that supervisor's word. Look into it. Ask a few questions. You know, make sure you do your due diligence to make sure you are issuing this discipline fairly and not based on anything that could be perceived as discriminatory, but is truly based on actual factual behavior that took place, attitudes, or if it's a PIP on actual performance problems and not just perceived issues because somebody doesn't like somebody else. All right. We are six minutes over. Um, I'll be glad to stay on if anybody does have any thoughts or questions, but if not, we are done. I appreciate all of your time today. And again, this recording will go out um, either later today or early tomorrow. So you can rewatch it or share it internally. Feel free to share it with whoever you'd like to, okay? And if anybody has any questions, again, I'll stay on. But if not, we are done for today. I appreciate everybody joining us. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good day. Yes, thanks so much, James. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a great day.